Hi guys, welcome to another study. Uh, tonight I wanted to talk about the um, Habakkuk commentary from the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, just because I found a few extra pieces to it this last week, and uh, an interesting kind of a study on one of the words that it used. So I wanted to uh, start that tonight. So on Thursdays we have a Q&A, and you can post questions in the community tab. And then 7 p.m. on Mondays, we have our weekly studies. So just FYI for everyone. So let's get started, and then we'll go to the chat room and see if there's any questions. Um, let's see here. So this is the Habakkuk commentary. It's called, uh, and actually that should be 1P. H-A-B, for Pesher, or commentary. But what's interesting about this, we have Habakkuk and a lot of the others that are basically word perfect in the Hebrew, but this is a commentary, so it's interesting to look at the commentary and go forward. We'll look at that tonight, but there's some extra information in here that I thought was really interesting. So first off, I want you to notice that it starts off, and it's fragmented, so we're kind of starting in verse 5 of 1. So we're missing the, the verses and the commentary for the first four verses. But anyway, it starts off uh, with verse 5, and you can see that there. But it starts off saying, this concerns the beginning of the final generation. Now that was probably on the previous um, verse, verse 5, verse 4 rather. But I wanted you to notice where it says generation here. Because we had been talking about um, uh, the ages, and the, basically the way the calendar works is that uh, all of human time is divided into four ages. Each age is 2,000 years apiece. So there's the age of creation, the age of Torah, and the age of grace, 2,000 years apiece. That's 6,000 years of human history. And then there is a 1,000-year age uh, called uh, the age of... Uh, the kingdom, and where Messiah will be ruling. So that's the basic outline of the entire thing. Each one of those ages are divided into five, or excuse me, four periods of 500 years apiece. And those periods sometimes are also called ages, uh, or onas, or other, com other, um, other terms. But basically, at the end of their age, when Messiah was supposed to come the first time, it's the end of the eighth age. We're at the end of the twelfth now, and so Messiah should come back and start the messianic kingdom many times, sometime very soon. But with that in mind, looking at uh, the, the idea of uh, you have a year, seven years is a shemitah or a seven-year period, kind of like our decade, and seven of those is forty-nine years, and then you have a year which is a jubilee year. And then the process starts all over again. So two jubilees is 100 years. Four jubilees would be 200 years. So when you get up to 10, that's a 500-year period. And then the age kind of flips around again. But thinking about that, um, if we go over to Esword, and I mentioned this to you the other last week, I think it was. This is Ephesians 3.21. And this is the LITV, which is a little closer to the Hebrew, or to the Greek, rather. But we're talking through uh, Christ, the establishment of the age of grace, and throughout all the ages we'll be able to glorify the Lord, that kind of thing. And it says here, it's kind of interesting, it says, To him be the glory in the church of Jesus Christ, or the assembly of Jesus Christ, to all the generations of the age and of the ages. So... If Paul understands the um, Essene calendar and is using that or focusing on that, believes it to be true, we have generations that make up ages that make up ages or periods that make up ages. Now, you can't tell for sure what these are because this would be Greek instead of Hebrew. So if I said age and maybe there's two or three words and one means something specific in Hebrew, then when I'm quoting the words that can mean age in Greek, I may or may not be talking about the same thing. So it's just one of those guesses, but you have to look at it all together. But if this is talking about all of the generations or 
jubilees, 50-year periods, in each one of the ages, 500-year periods, of all of the ages, the 2,000-year periods, those are the three pieces to the calendar. And so that's really interesting to me. And if we can look at it that way, <clears throat> there's a good chance that the word generations, not everywhere in the New Testament, but when we're talking about uh, calendars, ages, time periods, prophecy, something like that, a generation might actually be a jubilee. And that's kind of important because a lot of people, when they focus on the scripture that says where Jesus said, um, the generation that sees this will not pass until everything's been fulfilled. And we speculate on a generation being 40 years, 50 years, 70 years, 80 years, 100 years, or 120 years, or something else. And sometimes a generation just means between when I was born and when my firstborn son is born. And so it could be a random amount of time. Uh, but this is interesting. If if we can plug those two together, Jesus might have been saying the Jubilee period in which you see this happen will continue until all things are fulfilled. And back in his time period, that's interesting because the last Jubilee would have been from 25 AD to 75 AD. Five years into the last Jubilee, he starts his ministry for three and a half years. Um, again, the first three and a half years of uh, Shemitah at that point. So really interesting um, to see that. So going back to our text, it's interesting here. Uh, and again, the, the, the concept is that all of the Old Testament prophets in some way literally uh, double fulfillment prophecy or type or shadow or something somehow has to do with the end of the age. And in many times, the end of the age is. So this would be focusing on mainly the first coming of the Messiah, and maybe also ours too. So when it talks about the final generation, it's just interesting. We could be talking about that last 50-year period. Okay, and then he quotes verse 5. And it's interesting here because it says, You among the heathen and regard and wonder marvelously, for I will do a work in your days, which you will not believe even if I told you. And they say the interpretation of this verse is that it concerns the unfaithful, that be on the unfaithful Jews of that period, or of the, you know, they say they're part of the covenant, but they were actually apostate. The unfaithful who followed the liar and refused to listen to the teacher of righteousness. Now, in other places, we'll find out that the teacher of righteousness is the Messiah. He's the one that came, and the liar, which is the wicked priest, had him put to death. And that event of his death happened about 40 years before the destruction of the temple. That's one of the texts actually says that. So if there's a righteous person that was put to death, called the teacher of righteousness, focusing on the new covenant and the prophecies, that died approximately 32 AD, give or take a couple of years, that has to be talking about the Messiah. I still run into a lot of people that say, well, the teacher of righteousness is probably the guy that started the Essene group a couple of hundred years BC. And I always think that's funny. It's like he starts at a couple hundred years BC and dies in 32. So he's like, what, 300 years old when he dies? This, you know, it's just, and I guess you could say, well, sometimes teacher of righteousness means the leader of the group. And eventually it'll be the leader of the group, the Messiah. So in any way, this is talking specifically about the final 50-year period. So in the time period between 25 AD and 75 AD, there is this teacher of righteousness. So that's not somebody a couple of hundred years BC. And there's this liar. We don't know who he is yet, but this liar gets a whole lot of Jews, people to follow him and and gets them to refuse to even listen to the teacher of righteousness. Now, the teacher of righteousness, it says here, whose words are from the very mouth of God. And that makes it kind of sounds like, you know, God gave him information. This could actually be translated, it is the very mouth of God, which because the teacher of righteousness is God incarnate. We see that in uh, 11Q13, among other manuscripts. 
Okay, so anyway, these are the unfaithful of the new covenant who have not believed in the covenant of God, having blasphemed his holy name. So this is interesting. The covenant of Moses says that Jews are supposed to have rituals. The Levitical priesthood is supposed to do things. It's supposed to be a certain way until Messiah comes, and then he changes some things. Whatever he says to do, if he changes something, whatever, just follow directions. That's the whole idea. These guys have said, no, Gentiles have to convert to Judaism. Jews and Gentiles both have to do ceremonial law. They got it all garbled. And then the apostasy came where they tried to kill people who thought differently. And hence the liar making people not listen to the teacher of righteousness. But the concept is when he comes, he's supposed to die for our sins. The very next Pentecost, there's supposed to be this ushering in of the age of grace. And that's what they're all waiting for. Um, and right now they're all practicing the Mosaic Law because they're Zadok priests in Qumran and other areas. So this is specifically talking about those that are unfaithful because they adhere to the Old Covenant in a twisted way and don't recognize when the New Covenant comes, they're supposed to follow the New Covenant and the Teacher of Righteousness. But they haven't really believed the Covenant of God, or they would. You know, I mean, it's like, for instance, in the Old Testament, when it says, uh, when you sacrificed, uh, get unhewn stones and pile them together and sacrifice on it, because if you lift a tool on it, you pollute the whole thing. So you don't want to fasten or craft an altar. It has to be just rocks, right? Until the Lord shows you where he puts his name, which is Jerusalem. And then they build a temple. And in the temple, it's the opposite. There's a hewn or a carved altar, not just rocks. And that rock altar was a temporary thing only until the temple comes. From that time forward, it's illegal. It's wrong, you know, sinful to use the rocks. Okay. So there's lots of examples like this. This is a temporary thing until this. And so if you're reading it right, you would understand that. But these guys read the scriptures wrong and forget to uh, embrace the new covenant when the teacher of righteousness comes. As a matter of fact, they rebel against him and teach other people not to even listen to him. So that's pretty interesting. And by doing that, they blaspheme the holy name of God. That's pretty interesting. Okay, so second, that's first. First, the interpretation has to do with those people. But second, it concerns the unfaithful at the end of days. So this is interesting to us. The end of days is the end of an age. And they had one back then with the first coming. We have one right now at the beginning of the second coming. So this is telling us that this is a kind of a dual fulfillment prophecy. So it has to do with people that reject Messiah when he comes, following the liar. We'll have to figure out who the liar is, whether it's Caiaphas or Annas or Pilate or somebody. So right now we don't know. But second, it concerns the unfaithful at the end of days. Okay, These are men of violence. And yes, that's the word Hamas, but not, we're not talking about them at this point. Um, who are the breakers of the covenant? So there is going to be an apostasy in our day, just like there was an apostasy in their day. They did whatever the Lord told them to do and awaited Messiah. We're to do what the Lord's told us to do and await the Messiah. And in our day, our churches are being corrupted. They're beginning to teach that you can do whatever you want. You can fornicate, you can murder, you can do whatever. And that does be that is taught in different ways in different places. You got abortion and you've got all sorts of things. So the scriptures are clear, but the teaching uh, comes around. So now we've got people saying there is no second coming. Um, there is no rapture. Um, just all sorts of things like that. And so these are, and, and again, that's one thing to, uh, to listen to people. Like, for instance, I have a lot of friends that say, I really don't know if it's a pre-trib, mid-trib, whatever, because I've listened to so many people and I really just don't know. Well, that's fine. You've listened. You've tried to study. You're you're confused. You've let people confuse you, but that's fine. It's not a salvation issue. When the rapture happens, you'll go in it. 
Um, but that's one thing to say, I've listened and I've thought about it and I really haven't made a decision yet. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm not sure that's fine. But when you become a man of violence, that's the bad part. So when you get to the point where you will believe my way one way or the other, and even to excommunicate, even to the point to hurt or to kill, you know, that kind of thing, um, <clears throat> hate speech. So those are the things that we can't have. So the, we have in the end of days, men of violence who are breakers of the covenant that will not believe, even when they see or hear everything that happens in the final generation from the priest whom God gave the good news that he might interpret all the words of the prophets through whom he foretold that which would happen to his people in his land. So the Old Testament prophets do contain prophecies of our time as well as back then. And people who don't follow the priest, which I'm assuming is Messiah, uh, whom God gave the good news. Now, you know what good news is, right? Basar, gospel. So you can actually talk about there are people in that final generation. And if we're making this literal, from the time of 2025 to the time of 2075, that final generation of our age, there will be people who apostatize from the church, still calling themselves believers or Christians, but they break the covenant. They don't follow what the, the priest, the Messiah, taught about the gospel uh, and his interpretation of what the prophets said. So, I mean, you go back to Matthew 24 and 25, that's what Messiah said about the end times. You believe it or do you not? And there's going to be a group of people that say, yeah, prophecy, let's just not worry about it. Well, the scrolls say it's a serious sin to ignore prophecy. So it's pretty interesting that way. Um, let's see. For lo, I will raise up the Chaldeans, uh, that bitter and hasty nation, which shall march through the breadth of the land. Now, I, we look at this and we think, okay, Chaldeans, that's the Babylonian Empire. So this part is only for way back when. But what's really interesting about this is the Chaldeans, I think I've got that in here somewhere. Uh, the word for Chaldeans is only one letter different for the word for Katim, which is Romans. So it can be a play on words. It could be actually Chaldeans, which be Babylonians or the Babylonian Empire, or actually the Roman Empire. And they're going to interpret this as the Roman Empire for their day because Babylon is over and it happened with Babylon also. So it might be like a triple fulfillment, but that's what they're talking about. So these Chaldeans or Katim, bitter and a hasty nation shall march through the breadth of the land, that would be Israel, to possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. They are terrible and dreadful and their judgment and their dignity shall proceed from themselves. This interpretation, it says, concerns the Katim, which is the Romans or the Roman Empire, who strike all nations with fear and dread. They intentionally plot evil and deal with cunning and guile toward all nations. So it doesn't sound like a very good nation. <clears throat> now, along these lines, if we apply that to the last jubilee of our age, we have a Roman Empire of sorts, um, which we, or it looks like a Roman Empire and a religious empire. In the book of Revelation, we're, we call that the mystery Babylon religion or empire. So it's a type of Roman Empire, as we see in Revelation um, also, where it talks about in the mystery, it's the woman that sets on where seven hills are. So that doesn't necessarily mean the old Roman Empire. It doesn't necessarily mean Roman Catholicism, but there's some sort of a connection, okay? So just like there was a Roman Empire, and that was definitely literal back then, an actual Roman Empire, not Roman Catholicism, because it's hundreds of years, you know, out from here, but the Roman Empire. So it's not so much that it's pagan or that it looks Christian or doesn't look Christian, but there's other markings that we would identify the Babylonian Empire or the Babylonian mystery religion at that point. So let's see here. I'm going to 
go down here just for a second and make sure that everybody can hear me okay. Okay. Um, nobody's saying anything about sound not being good. So, okay. So with this then, um, then he goes to verse 12. We're missing a few things. Um, actually, let's just keep going down. I want to show you a couple of other things here. Um, talking about the, the group of people is treacherous. They're wicked. And the interpretation, it says, this refers to the house of Absalom. And I thought that was really interesting. Absalom, as you know, is David's son. So he's like the prince or the heir, but he's a, a rebel. He wants to destroy the kingdom, take the kingdom for himself. So he's a picture of the Antichrist. And actually there was um, someone named Absalom. Anyway, the, the concept is the house of Absalom would be the same as the house of of judgment or house of damnation, as it says here in a minute, uh, which is the group that looks Jewish, that claims to be Jewish, but is not following Zadok teaching. They're following Pharisee teaching. So this refers to the house of Absalom and its supporters. So all those people that sided with the liar, who were silent when the teacher of righteousness was punished and did not aid him against the liar, who had scorned the law in the midst of all peoples. This is one of those verses that we didn't have until, or I didn't realize was in there till this week. So I thought that was interesting. If the teacher of righteousness is here and he's being persecuted, you should do something about it. Now, you would have been stopped, of course, because that had to happen, but you don't have to side with the enemy. So that, I think that's kind of the important part. Um, let's see here. Now, this is interesting. Uh, I will stand on my watch and set at my tower and we'll watch and see. He will say to me and I will answer when I'm reproved. God told Habakkuk to write down what would happen to the final generation. And we see that that's what we're reading. But he did not reveal to him when the events of the final period would be complete. I thought that was interesting because, in a sense, if it's the final generation, you would know when it's complete as far as the, the, the time goes. But what are we talking about here? We're talking about the events in that final period. So the Romans come and the Romans destroy and disperse the Jewish nation. So when you look at it, the end of the age was exactly 75 AD. But you have Jesus being born about 2 B.C., uh, dying on the cross about 32, uh, the church being born in 32, the temple, Jerusalem temple being destroyed in 70, the Alexandrian temple being destroyed in 73, and then 75, the end of the age, which is also the Council of Yavne. And then in 130, 132, somewhere in there, the Bar Kokhba rebellion. And then after that, two or three years, the Romans dispersed it, the nation of Israel, and they cease to exist. So you're talking about really a 150-some year period where all of those events occur around the actual end of the age. And we can see the same thing if we go back and look at the end of the previous age with Abraham and Nimrod and stuff like that. So what I think this is saying is kind of like in Revelation when it says... Um, the days will be shortened so that no flesh would survive, or otherwise it would not survive. So we can look at this, and we know when the end of the age is, and that should be the start of the millennial reign. And seven years before that would be the tribulation period and that. And those definitely go together. But there's a lot of events that overlap those things. So that may not necessarily be the exact time that those things start. So we know the final period, we know the end of the age, and the events are somewhere close to the end of the age, give or take some time. So that's interesting. So that brings up like where Jesus said, no one really knows the hour or the day. Maybe the year, maybe the decade, the Shemitah, definitely the Jubilee, actually, the last couple of Jubilees anyway. And we've had that too. I mean, if the last Jubilee starts in, in 2025, Look what happened one or two jubilees back from that. Israel was born in 1948. Um, 
1967, they took the Temple Mount, all the different wars, the expansions, the things like that. So it's definitely been a lot more than 50 years. It's been 73 as of last week, and we're still going forward. Um, let's see here. Um, this interpretation, this part says, it concerns the teacher of righteousness to whom God made known all the mysteries of the words of his servants, the prophets. So the teacher of righteousness is 100% accurate in what he says. Uh, and that's pretty interesting. The vision is still for the appointed time, but speaks to the end and does not lie. So in other words, you might look at this and say, this part was fulfilled. This part was fulfilled. This part never happened. So apparently it's a lie or a typo or scribal error or whatever. He said, no, the vision is actually for the appointed time. And that's the word for Moedim, basically talking about the end times prophecy. It speaks to the end or the end times. It does not lie. So at this point, you may have one, two, and three, but not four. By the time you get to the end of our generation, you'll have all of them. Remember when... Uh, Jesus quoted uh, Isaiah 61, and he says, you know, I have come to the recovery of sight to the blind, all that stuff. And he stops right in the middle because to proclaim the acceptable day of the Lord. And the next part of that same sentence is, and the day of the vengeance. He stops in the middle of a sentence and says, and you're hearing this part is fulfilled. So sometimes we can actually split a sentence up. That part's first coming, this part's second coming, or something else. So it's interesting that he would say that. It's, it's all for an appointed time. Understand that if it's not fulfilled in your day, it will be at the end of the age because it does not lie. That's how I would interpret that. Now, they say this means that the final age shall be prolonged and shall exceed all that the prophets have said, for the mysteries of God are astounding. Now, one way you could preserve that or elongate, same way it happened back in the first century with Jesus being born in 2 BC, going to 32, going to 70, going to 135. Um, so lots of stuff could happen. So if we put that in our age, um, something could happen in 32, something might have happened, might happen in 25, something may have happened in 1998. You know, if we're that kind of a thing. And of course, 1948, 1967, so it's definitely elongated. So it's pretty interesting. Um, let's see here. Interpretation of this part says, this concerns those who follow the law of the house of Judah, whom God will deliver from their suffering in the house of judgment judgment or damnation it means it's been judged found to be evil and will be destroyed because of their faith in the teacher of righteousness so there are people that actually practice the law of uh, of the house of judah that understand it properly and when messiah comes they accept him so those that follow the law of the house of judah are different from those that follow the law of the house of damnation or the house of judgment so we're talking about basically Essenes, Zadok priests, people that are messianic, and the house of judgment would be those who follow the Sadducee Pharisee way, that reject Messiah when he comes. And these guys have salvation because they follow the law properly, and that leads them to understand who the actual teacher of righteousness is. There we go. And the teacher of righteousness, of course, is Messiah. Now, this next part here, I'm kind of going through it quickly. I just want to share a few things with you. Um, let's see here. Uh, this part, it says, this concerns the wicked priest. So there's actually a priest that turns on the Messiah. So that's interesting. This concerns the wicked priest who was truly called by Hashem when he first arose. So Annas or Caiaphas, I'm assuming, one or both of them actually were called by the Lord and actually did want to serve the Lord when they first arose or went into ministry. But they became perverted and, you know, became who they are 
for who they were. But isn't that interesting? This is saying that in the beginning, they really wanted to serve the Lord, but they didn't understand the law. They listened to the house of destruction and were perverted by it. So one thing that tells us is get into a good church, study the scriptures on your own and with your church, just to make sure your church is not a cult or something like that. Study it yourself. Be careful not to fall into a group that is a cult or somebody that's called a cult. If your group is called a cult by anybody, they might just be a jealous group and your group is fine, but check it out. Usually people say, I don't like them because they teach this. Okay, that's fine. But when somebody says your church is a cult, there's a good chance it might be. So you need to look at that very carefully. And your church, your personal church that you go to may not be, but the denomination might be weird or vice versa. So be very careful not to be led astray. The apostasy will be great. In First Thess or Second Thessalonians, it talks about when the apostasy comes, it's so um, clever that if it were possible, it would deceive even the very elect. And so we want to be not deceived. And the elect, the, by definition there in that verse, is those that have a love for the truth. So if you have a love for the scriptures and you study it, you try to understand it, you're not going to be led astray. If you never read the Bible, you won't know what's going on, and you will be led astray when some con artist comes along and gives you a really great line. So that's what's going on. So the wicked priest truly was called by Hashem when he first arose, but when he ruled over Israel, his heart became proud. He forsook God and betrayed the statutes for the sake of riches. Isn't that interesting? And this part, this is another piece here. Uh, he rises up to bite. This concerns that rebellious priest who persecuted the teacher of righteousness, who struck him during his evil judgment, and the stinking profaners. I thought that was interesting. Actually, stinking profaners that committed horrible things to him. And if we're talking about Messiah, we all know what it says in Matthew about that. So I thought that was really interesting that that would actually be in this commentary. Um, the rebellious priest who violated God's precepts, his wickedness is judged by the affliction of painful diseases that take vengeance upon his fleshly body. Now we know that happened with Herod. I don't have a record of it happening with Caiaphas or Anus, but apparently it did, according to what this is saying. Um, let's see here. This concerns the last priests of Jerusalem. There's a group of people that take spoil and they will be made spoil of, according to Habakkuk 2.8 and the previous verses. So this concerns the, the last priests of Jerusalem. Now remember, the true priests would have been exiled and actually almost executed uh, for this kind of a thing. So they left. So the priests that are in Jerusalem are false priests. They're not of the tribe of Zadok. They can't really be priests, but they've usurped it. So these last priests of Jerusalem who amass riches by plundering the people, but in their last days, the riches shall be delivered, delivered rather, to the hands of the Katim army, to the Roman army, for they are the remnant of the people. So it's interesting. Now we know what happened when they stayed in there and tried to fight the Romans. The Romans destroyed the temple, took all the gold and the silver and stuff with them, took the people into slavery. So that's exactly what did happen. Of course, that was 70 AD when that happened. Um... Okay, now this is interesting, too, uh, for the other part of this. The interpretation concerns that wicked priest who committed crimes against the teacher of righteousness and the men of his council. Remember, they had um, Peter and I think it was John uh, come into the judgment hall. Uh, they were judged, and they said, don't talk about this Jesus anymore. And they said, well, we have to just, we have to tell what we've seen. They had him whip, whipped and then thrown out, which is part of the law. But 
It is interesting, though, that they persecuted the men of his council or the apostles. Because of his wickedness against his elect, that wicked priest, the wicked priest's wickedness against the elect of God, men of his council, God delivered him to the hands of his enemies to bitterly humiliate him by means of a destroying scourge. Now, this is interesting to me that it would be kind of done that way. Um, the destroying scourge is talked about in several things, several places, a few places rather. Um, Bill Salas has mentioned that as being uh, some sort of a covenant with death, and it's mentioned in one of the, the Old Testament places. But it really does seem to talk about the whole idea that, you know, you make friends with an enemy to destroy the righteous, and then that enemy will turn on you. It's a destroying scourge. And we see that kind of a thing in Revelation with the Antichrist in the end times. So again, this is very applicable to us. But I want to get to... Let me go down here. I just want to share a couple of things with you. This one that was really interesting. This part is kind of interesting. Uh, this refers to the lying prophet. Now, I'm not sure who the lying prophet is. Um, I think it was Caiaphas that actually did an actual prophecy about that one has to die for the nation. Therefore, we must put you know Jesus to death. So we could be talking about that, but a lying prophet, and that we know we do know in our time at the end of our age with the tribulation period there's a antichrist and a false prophet uh, and there's lots of lying prophets but there is a lying prophet who has beguiled many in order to rebuild his town of vanity in bloodshed so again we're talking about that apostasy that comes you have to do it his way or he kills you and in order that his town should stand to bear witness with deceit by means of its new glory, in order that many might toil in his vain service, in order that they might conceive through deceitful works, in order that their labor might be for nothing, that it might come into the judgment of fire for having insulted and outraged the elect of God. I think that is really interesting. Whether you're talking about the Christians or the faithful Jews that interpret the Scripture's prophecy, either way, they're both uh, actually, they're the same thing, if you think about it, because in the beginning there were no Gentile or very few Gentile believers or Christians. It was mainly Jewish. Um, okay, this is what I wanted to show you. This is really interesting, and we've talked about this a little before. Out of uh, verse 215, it says, Woe to him that gives his neighbor to drink and puts the bottle to him and makes him drunk also that you may look upon uh, their nakedness. So the concept of getting someone drunk so you can go into their house and steal all of their stuff um, or kill them or whatever you're going to do, the whole nine yards. Um, and so this is things that would be the epitome of wickedness in that time. But look at this. This is really interesting. Um, Two or three episodes back on The Chosen, there was a episode where the disciples decided to help Jesus out, you know, because he was too busy and wasn't doing it right. So they, we've got to go to the right people, not just go out to, you know, poor people, but the people of notoriety. So they start making this list, you know, like, well, he's got to go to the Sanhedrin. He's got to go here. Oh, the guy over there, we got to go here. And in one part of their list, they actually said, oh, yeah, and uh, the scribes in Qumran, we, we need to go there. Oh, yeah, and, and then they go on with the list. So it's really interesting that they're in there talking about the fact that they need to go to the Zadok priests, too. Um, so this is interesting. Look at this very, very carefully. It says, this concerns the wicked priest. So that would be Caiaphas probably again same one we've been talking about, who pursued the teacher of righteousness 
to the house of his exile. Now the priests that were exiled were Zadok priests, so that's his scenes. At that time, being protected by Rome, the house of their exile was Qumran, or possibly the Alexandrian temple. But notice this then. So the teacher of righteousness was in the house of his exile. It's his house. And let me explain this. Um, in the Damascus document, it talks about Damascus as being the headquarters of the new covenant. And people always, you know, kind of scratch their heads and it's like, what's Damascus, Syria got to do with anything? Well, nothing. Uh, Damascus, Syria is Damascus, Syria, but this is what's called New Damascus. And the word Damascus is broken up. And as you can see, the word Dom means blood and the word Mesque means um, uh, an heir you know, or a stronghold or a prince that, you know, inherits the kingdom, that kind of thing. So Damascus literally would be the house of the blood heir. And so New Damascus is the place that is set aside for the worship of the Messiah as he comes, and it's his place. So this is saying when the teacher of righteousness actually went to the house of his exile, that would be New Damascus or Qumran. So you have a situation where the teacher of righteousness is preaching in Qumran to the Zadok priests. That's not a big surprise because he probably would have went everywhere. But this wicked priest actually pursues him to persecute him all the way down there. Now, in the beginning, they would have killed off the priests, and that's why they went to Alexandria and, and way out. But as soon as we get to like 65 B.C., where Rome steps in and says people need to stop killing each other and they take over. At that point, for a group of Pharisees to run over to another town and attack and kill a group of Sadducees or Essenes or whatever, they would be executed on the spot. I mean, Rome, there, there would be hundreds of Roman soldiers to kill every one of them. So at this point, there is an order. You don't just run and kill somebody. So now you have them coming back to Qumran, they're there, Messiah comes there, but the wicked priest actually takes a group of people apparently to Qumran to destroy or uh, arrest something like that to the Messiah. So this, the wicked priest pursues the teacher of righteousness to the house of his exile with intense fury to destroy him by stripping him of his clothing. Now, stripping you of your clothing, it's, it's an idiom. If I was in the military and I had, you know, the, the stuff here to show that I was a general or a lieutenant or, or something, and I was stripped of my rank, they would take those the insignias off, maybe even take my, all my clothes off because I'm no longer a general or whatever. So what, what this is saying is he came to destroy him by stripping him of his authority you know, saying this man is not the Messiah, he's a false prophet, he's, you know, this kind of stuff. Now, this is interesting because, so this happens, and of course, you could come and accuse him, and maybe they came to arrest him, but remember, not a wise idea, number one, with Romans around. Number two, coming to an enclave of Zadok priests, where part of the law is every single one of them is armed. Uh, small weapons, you know, it's it's small knives, basically, short swords. Uh, but still, you, you don't walk into a group of armed men and tell them what to do. You're the one that's going to get killed, not the Messiah. So it's interesting that they would even try something like that. Uh, but look at this. So he comes to destroy him, to strip him of his rank, his authority, claiming that he's false prophet. At the time appointed, look at this. This is interesting. At the time appointed for the day of the rest of the Day of Atonement. So he was actually in Qumran preaching on the Day of Atonement. Apparently the proper one noticed this because if the high priest would not be running around on the Day of Atonement. So we see two separate calendars here. This is the Day of Atonement on the Essene calendar, which is not the Day of Atonement on the Pharisee calendar which would allow the Pharisee high priest to come and argue. But at the time appointed for the rest 
the Sabbath rest of the Day of Atonement, he appeared before them to condemn him. Now, I didn't think that much about it, um, but we're talking about the Messiah appeared before them, the, the delegation that came to, and then he condemned them. But this word here appeared, it was interesting. I was doing a study with it, and a Messianic friend of mine uh, showed me that it's the Hebrew word Yafa, and it's very rarely used. I mean, there's a lot of words for appearance or shining or brightness or glory or, you know, things like that. This word is only used a half a dozen times. And when we go look these up, it seems to be almost always used and maybe always used when God reveals himself or manifests himself like a Christophany or a uh, Theophany. So here, for instance, there are a couple of occurrences. Let me just run down here. So here's Psalm 94, verse 1, and that's when God shows himself, okay? And then Psalm 52 is when God shined and taught them things. And this is interesting here. Psalm 80, verse 1 is when God shined from between the cherubim over the mercy seat. So in each one of these cases, it, we're, we're seeing that God manifests himself, you know, like you have the Urim and the Thummim or something like that. And you come and you, you ask God for something. Maybe nobody shows up, but then all of a sudden God manifests himself, pillar of fire, smoke, something. And then God speaks. That's a manifestation or a appearance like that. So if this is the case, we run back up here. This is interesting. So the wicked priest pursued the teacher of righteousness, Jesus the Messiah, Yeshua, to the house of his exile, New Damascus, with intense fury to destroy him by stripping him of his rank. And it was on the day appointed for the rest of the Day of Atonement, the Day of Atonement's rest. Now, it's interesting. We have a rabbinic tradition on the Day of Atonement that you're supposed to fast, which is to not eat food. And you go watch TV or goof off or whatever. You just don't eat. Well, that's not what the scripture says. The scripture says you're supposed to afflict your soul. It's got nothing to do with food. It's a day to reflect. Am I doing what I'm supposed to for the Lord? Let's pray. Let's, let's seek the Lord's face. Let's try to figure this out. Can I do something better this year? Uh, did I sin? Do I need to repent? If not, do I just need to do something more? What, what would the Lord have me to do? To afflict my soul and try to get right with the Lord completely. That's what I'm supposed to be doing. Whether I'm eating while, while I'm praying or not is irrelevant. So you're supposed to afflict your souls. So it's simply a day of rest and reflection on what the Lord wants you to do. But at this point, at the time appointed for the rest, on the Day of Atonement, Jesus then, Yeshua the Messiah, appeared before them to condemn them. Now, he's already standing there because they come in and condemn him. So then he appears and condemns them. I'm thinking this is talking about something like what we saw in the Gospels with the um, um, Mount of Transfiguration. All of a sudden, he shone like the heavens, and there was Moses and Elijah there. So if he did something like this in Qumran, that would have been amazing. So, so he does this, he appears to them to condemn them and to rebuke them about the fast day, the Sabbath, which was only meant for their rest. So they're probably saying he can't do this because he's violating the tradition of the elders about the Sabbath of, the, of Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And he rebukes them, you know, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. You, you're perverting the law again. So I just thought that was really interesting there. And let me just show you one other thing here. Um, let's see here. Okay, a couple of other interesting things in here, but I'll we'll just look at this one and then we'll close for tonight. But this is talking about they make a graven image or a molten image. And it, well, what profits the graven image and the maker thereof has graven it or the molten image 
and the teacher of lies uh, that the maker of this work trusts therein to make a dumb idol. So you look at that and you think this is just talking about people that worship idols that say they're gods that they moved or whatever, just liars. So they're just pagans, you know, and that's what we're talking about. But what's interesting, again, is if this is an end time prophecy, the teacher of lies would be the liar, the Caiaphas, the, the Pharisee, Sadducee per people. And but molten images and graven images and idols. What are what are those? Because even though they were corrupt, none of them had idols like we think of as an actual idol. But look at what it says here. The interpretation. Um, what prophet is an idol? An idol that someone has made is an image, okay, and that we understand that, or it's a source of false teaching, though its maker trusts in what he has made. So what's interesting about that is if the scripture says there's going to be a Messiah that comes, he comes in 32 AD, I'm thinking of Daniel 9 and, and MQ 13 and, and things like that, and he comes to die for our sins, start the age of grace. Um, and then all of a sudden a guy comes, he's named Yeshua, he's healing people, he's raising the dead. That's got to be him. Uh, anybody with eyes can see this. So if you follow, follow. But to actually see that and decide, I'm going to believe something different. The Messiah is just a general. He's not God incarnate. He doesn't die for our sins. He's not virgin born. Those prophecies mean something else then you're making your own religion. You're making up your own religion, your own festivals, your own thing. You're perverting it. So the source of false teaching would be Phariseeism or Sadduceeism, as we've seen with some of the things that they teach. But that in itself is idolatry. I just thought that was really fascinating. So then it ends by saying, Woe to him that said to the wood, Awake, or to the dumb stone, Arise, and it shall teach. Behold, it is laid over with gold and silver, and there's no breath at all in the middle of it. So idols are irrelevant, actual stone idols. This interpretation is making for them himself gods without a voice. The interpretation of the matter concerns all idols of the peoples that they're made to worship and to bow to something. And that's where it kind of ends. So really interesting in that point. One other thing real quick. Up here, it talks about the community of Yahad. Now, Yahad is the name that the Essenes or the Zadok priests gave their movement. So everyone that followed them is Yahad. And I've talked on this before. The word Yah is the short form of the word for God, for Yahweh, or Yehovah. It's Yah. And then uh, Yahad, which would be kind of like this. It's actually E-H-A-D. So Ehad means one, a group of people that become one some, some way, or a man and a woman become one. So it's a group of unity. So in this case, it's the group of people that are one in God. So people that are one in the spirit, because they do believe in the Holy Spirit. So it's really neat, just like that old song, we are one in the spirit, we're one in the Lord. So these are the group or the community of Yah. And uh, I had a note down here. I, I was looking this up, and I just figured that was something they meant because they usually translate it community. But it does appear, the word actually appears once in the Old Testament. I was unaware of this. And it's in Esther 8, 17. And it talks, it's translated, uh, they became Jews. So Judaizing or became Jews or something like that. Um, and of course, if back in those days they taught true Judaism the way the Zadoks did, it means they became believers. So they became Noahides. They believed on what the Jews were doing, waited for Messiah to come. They didn't proselytize. And they definitely didn't become Pharisees or Sadducees because that didn't exist yet. But I just thought that was really interesting um, they're saying it's the same thing. So the way it was, the ancient paths are the ones that they follow today. So I just wanted to share that with you and talk a little bit about that because there's several things in there. But I was just amazed that whole concept that we could actually have 
a record that the Messiah preached in Qumran once, and the high priest had troops go in to arrest him, and he manifested himself like he did on the um, Mount of uh, Transfiguration. Can you imagine what, wouldn't it have been something to have been there and seen that? That's just amazing. So anyway, there's a couple of new verses and a couple of new points on words from the Habakkuk commentary. And so, all right, well, I will go ahead and stop there for tonight, and we will see you guys Thursday. So God bless, and you guys have a good week.